coming to you now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urie, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Well, greetings and welcome again to Bread of His Presence. You know, we've been taking a look together at the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 31, which gives us Jesus' answer to the question posed to him by this scribe, this lawyer, who asks him, what is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus answers his question by quoting right from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, which begins what is known as the Shema, an oath of loyalty that is pledged by every practicing Jew daily, morning and evening. It says in Mark 12, 28 to 31, And when one of the scribes came and heard them arguing, he recognized that he, Jesus, had answered them well, and asked him, What commandment is the foremost or greatest of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, the word we began looking at last week, and which will be our main focus today, is the Hebrew word ahava the word we translate here as love. Now, we know that Mark's gospel was written in Greek, but the passage that Jesus is quoting from here in Deuteronomy 6 is Hebrew, and Jesus would have quoted it in Hebrew. And this is so important because in Hebrew, as we saw last week, words that in our language usually refer only to mental activities have in Hebrew an active element as well. And the same is true of Ahava. Yes, it involves the emotion of love, but it goes beyond that in that like Shema, it can also describe actions associated with love, not just an inward mental state or emotion. Ahava can also mean to act lovingly towards someone, or to be loyal to someone. Now, before we go any further, I need to clarify that in no way do I want to downplay emotion. Our emotions are very, very important to God, and He wants us to express them. Probably one of the most incredible I love you God moments in the Bible takes place when David brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem after it had been lost a generation before. It says in 2 Samuel 6, And David was dancing before Yahweh with all his strength, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the Ark of Yahweh with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Now, Not everyone was happy about this undignified display of emotion, including David's wife, Michael, daughter of Saul. And remember, she rebukes him for taking off his royal robes in front of the maids. Now, he wasn't naked because, of course, he was still wearing that linen ephod, which was made of fine linen, consisted of two pieces, and it covered both his front and his back. But He was humbling himself in taking off all his royal garb. And he did that because he knew that the only one who ought to be celebrated in that moment was not a king, but God himself. And I love how instead of listening to Michael, he doubles down. It says, So David said to Michael, It was before Yahweh who chose me above your father and above all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of Yahweh, over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before Yahweh, and I will be esteemed even more lightly than this, and will be humble 
in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be glorified. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. And that may have been God's judgment upon her. But the important thing is for us to see that David saw value in expressing emotion to God. And I think God honored him for that. Because he was willing to show emotion even in the face of criticism. Now, there was somebody else who was also not afraid to show emotion. And that, of course, was Jesus himself. I love this quote from G. Walter Hansenen in Christianity Today. He says, I am spellbound by the intensity of Jesus' emotions. Not a twinge of pity, but heartbroken compassion. Not a passing irritation, but terrifying anger. Not a silent tear, but groans of anguish. Not a weak smile, but ecstatic celebration. Jesus' emotions are like a mountain river cascading with clear water. My emotions, he says, are more like a muddy foam or a feeble trickle. And so emotion is important. But what we have to understand is that emotions are not what ought to lead in a relationship. Faithfulness and submission must always Come first. You know, I remember talking with my mentor, Dr. Roman Miller, years ago before he went to heaven. And he was saying that so oftentimes Christians expect God to make them feel like obeying, to feel good before they will obey him. Lord, help me to feel so in love with you that I want to obey you. You see, they want to have the emotion first. But he said, it doesn't work like that. Obedience comes first, not emotion. Now, emotions follow, but obedience must always come first. We feel good after we have obeyed. We feel closer to the Lord after we have said, okay, God, I will obey. Not always before. You see, you have to choose faithfulness. And that provides the grounding for the emotions that follow. That's what it means to lead your heart. I also love this quote by C.S. Lewis. In his book, Mere Christianity, he writes, Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. You know, I once read a story where someone actually was led to live this out. Newspaper columnist and minister George Crane, he tells of a wife who came into his office just full, just seething with hatred toward her husband. She said, I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has hurt me. And Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. He said, go home and act as if you really loved your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be as kind, considerate, and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe that you love him. And after you've convinced him of your undying love and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him you're getting a divorce. That will really crush him. And so with revenge in her eyes, she smiled and exclaimed, Beautiful, beautiful, will he ever be surprised. And she did it with enthusiasm, acting as if. For two months, she showed love, kindness, listening, giving, reinforcing, sharing. 
and when she didn't return, Crane called. Are you ready now to go through with the divorce? He asked her. Divorce, she exclaimed. Never. I discovered I really do love him. You see, her actions had changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. The ability to love is established not so much by fervent promise as often repeated deeds. Now, understanding the meaning of ahava can really shed a lot of light on some of the words of Jesus. You know, one of his most unpopular teachings, um, one of my least favorite, is probably the one he gives in Luke 6, verses 27 to 28. He says, But I say to you who hear, who shema, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who disparage you. Now, understanding the active side of both hear, shema, and love, ahava, in this passage, reveals to us that when Jesus commands us to love our enemies— He's not talking about having nice thoughts. No, he's talking about demonstrating in our actions our love towards them. Now, emotions will often follow. God can and often does change the way that you feel towards another person. But it begins with action, with obedience. And that's tough. Because what all this reveals to us is that it is not enough just to not do evil towards our enemies. No, we have to do good to them as well. You know, just recently I was talking with a former professor of mine from Wesley Biblical Seminary, Dr. Matt Friedemann, and he was telling me about a couple who had recently gone to a restaurant. And while they were there, they started praying. But there was a couple in the booth next to them that included a woman who just started booing them. She booed them through their whole prayer. Just boo! And the husband left and posted about it, asking, you know, what's our response to that? What do we do? And you know, of all the comments, the best one was this. Well, did you pay for their meal? You see, that's Jesus. Who in their right mind would ever think like that? Jesus did. And guess what? He calls for us to think, and more importantly, to act like that. Now, this sheds light on both the first half of the Ten Commandments, which have to do with our relationship with God, but also the second half of the Ten Commandments, which have to do with our relationship with our neighbor. On tablet one was the description of our active loyalty to God. On tablet two was the description of our active loyalty to our neighbor. And it's interesting to note that Jesus, when asked to name the greatest commandment, gives two. The first having to do with the vertical, and then the second one having to do with the horizontal. You see, you have to have both. He was saying that in both our vertical and our horizontal relationships, we must demonstrate, not just in our emotions, but in faithful action, our love for God and for our neighbor. You know, I try to tell my kids that I love them as often as I can, and I think I can safely say that I say it to them at least once, but usually more than once every single day. And I do often mean that in an emotional sense. But if I were to say to them, I love you, but were to never feed them, never dress them, never take them to school, never read to them, have devotions with them, pray for them, pray with them, take them to the doctor when they need it, could I really say that I ahava them? No. Well, the same thing applies to our relationship with God. If we tell God that we love him, but don't listen to him, obey him, and repent from all the sin in our lives, can we really say that we ahava him? 
Apparently not. But that's what Jesus wants us to do and is what he can empower in our lives if we want him to and ask him to. As is promised to us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. If you need to, ask him for that forgiveness and cleansing today and he will be faithful to do it. Do so today. Amen and amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.